Welcome to the Bible Study Hour from the Pikes Peak Church of Christ here in Colorado Springs. We're delighted that you're joining us this morning and hope you've been along for the ride for the past several weeks and have been enjoying these lessons and learning something from our study of the finding of the New Testament church. If you haven't been involved in those studies, that are all still available here on our YouTube channel. So feel free to go back and look at those. They'll be on our regular Sunday broadcast at the very first. And you can take those in as well as several other studies that we've done since we went into quarantine back in March of last year. As we continue on with our time together this morning, let's pause and have a prayer and then we'll get into our study. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day, for this opportunity to be together, for all of the wonderful blessings you've given to us. And we're especially thankful that we are gradually and slowly pulling out of the isolation and being able to be back out in public and around each other. And we're so glad that we can see each other's faces again, and we pray that that will continue to grow and be a blessing to us over the coming weeks. Father, bless us in this study this morning. Help us to learn what you have to say about your church, the one that your son purchased with his own blood. And we thank you so much for that, knowing that only in him do we have salvation. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We continue our study of finding the church of the New Testament. Our motivation behind this was simply, what does the New Testament say about church? We haven't looked at too many things about what scholars have said and what later authors have said or even what our modern world says about church, but we've determined that the best way to learn what the New Testament church was like was to look, well, at the New Testament. And so that's what we've been doing. And last week, uh, we talked about the idea of the structure and authority in the church. What did that look like in the New Testament? And we first and foremost said that without equivocation, without hesitation, without a shred of doubt, that Jesus is the head of the church. And by that we mean the whole worldwide church. Church, whether it's in the United States or it's in Africa or South America or 
even as we pointed out we have a member of the lord's church on the international space station a few weeks ago and so wherever you are in the world if you're part of that worldwide church jesus is the head of that church we talked about that as we read through the pages of the new testament that the apostles were at that time the worldwide and local authority while they were living we know that they all eventually died and, and they were no longer there to be that leadership inspired directly by the Holy Spirit. And so we looked at the idea that after that, the elders became the authority on the local level. And that's what was different, perhaps. Jesus is the head of the whole church. The apostles were the worldwide authority. And some served as local authority. Peter calls himself an elder. And so we understand that there was a local sense in that. But as we read through the pages of the New Testament, and we discussed uh, last week the idea of the eldership and elders in a church were in every city, were in every church. And so elders became the, the authority on the local level, and that seems to continue today because there's been no other instruction and guidance given to us about what we should do in addition to that. And that progression makes perfect sense. Jesus left this world while he was with the apostles. He was the head of the church in a very real and practical sense. But when he left, he left the apostles to be his representatives. And you recall, he promised them the helper, the Holy Spirit, which would remind them of everything he had taught and would guide them to into all truth so that they would know what it was they needed to teach. And one of the things they taught as Paul told Titus, you establish elders in every city. Why? Well, he said just before that, to set things in order. The way things needed to be, the way the church was to be ordered, Titus had a hand in that, Timothy had a hand in that, Paul and Peter and all the rest of the apostles had a hand in making sure the church was established in such a way when they were no longer there, it would continue on in faith and in truth. And the elders became the focal point of that authority. And as we said, the elders' authority comes from Scripture. And the elders' authority does not extend beyond Scripture. It is contained in Scripture and how they watch over us and how they rule over us, as we talked about last week. But we were in the midst of discussion before we ran out of time, and we were talking about who are these elders and what are these elders and what do we need to know and understand about them. And we were looking at 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 7. And we won't read this all again because we read it last week. But here was where we left off. It says there in verse 1, this is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good report. And it goes on to talk about the qualifications of these people who would be called bishops. And so we ask the question, well, that's not the word elder as we have it in our English language. Is there any connection between this word bishop and the word elder that we've talked about already. We go to Titus, where there is a similar list of qualifications for somebody who is called a bishop. But notice there in verse 5, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking, and appoint elders in every city as I have commanded you. And then, building on that thought, there's no change of subject here, if a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, Having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination, these sound remarkably like what Paul told Timothy in the passage we just left. For a bishop, again continuing, that for is a continuation word, it's a linking word. Having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent. And again, the list of those qualifications going on. And so it gives us an idea there of the fact that elders and bishops perhaps are referring to the same role in the church, the same office, if we want to call it that. And we'll talk just a little bit more about that later. Let's move on to some new scriptures we didn't look at last week. In Acts chapter 20, in verses 17 through 28, Paul is on his way back to Jerusalem. And he knows what's going to happen to him at Jerusalem. He'll be arrested. He's going to be then ultimately, although I don't know Paul knew this, sent back to Rome where he would suffer a martyr's death if our traditional stories and histories about him are correct. But in verse 17 from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know that from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. 
how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you, and taught you publicly from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see now, I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying, The chains and tribulations await me. Again, Paul knew a little bit about what was coming for him. Verse 24, But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy. And the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God, and indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, and shepherds, overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Now remember, who's he talking to here? Back to verse 17. He called for the elders of the church, and he said to them, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, that agricultural sheep shepherd analogy that he Jesus used so many times in his ministry. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, and shepherd, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And we go to 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 7. And there Paul says, He himself gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some evangelists, and some, and we'll focus on that word, pastors and teachers. Uh, that's there in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verse 28. Of chapter 20 of Acts, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. That's the passage we just read, the end of it, but let's read on. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch. And remember that for three years I did not cease to warn you every night and day with tears. And so we talking about these elders, and there's the term bishop, and there's the term overseer, and there's the term shepherd, and there's the term pastor, and there's the idea of watching there as related to this role of these individuals who all seem to be filling that role we call an elder. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, verse 17, and verse 24. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Verse 17. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Greet all those who rule over you and all the saints. Those from Italy greet you. And so again, there's that idea of those who rule over them, those who rule over them. And it's not the rulers in a, obviously, a physical sense, as in kings and governors and things of that nature, because you notice it says there, for they watch out for your souls. And so again, was in that church context, and seems to fit into this idea of, of elders and bishops and all of that. So let's think about that just a little bit further. The word elder, Greek word presbyteros. It's translated elder, or it's translated presbyter, depending on the version that you're using. It appears in Titus chapter 1 and verse 5, Acts chapter 20 and verse 17. Then we have another word, episkopos. It's the one translated bishop, translated overseer in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 1, and second Ti or in uh, 2 Timothy 3 verses 1 and 2, Titus 1 and verse 7, and Acts chapter 20. In verse 28. And then we have the word shepherd. To shepherd the flock. The word poimain. It's translated shepherd. It's also the word that's translated pastor. Uh, that we read just a few minutes ago. Again Acts 20 and verse 28. Ephesians chapter 4. And verse 11. And then there's the word Gregoriite. That's the word watch. Translated watch. Acts chapter 20 and verse 31. The idea of a watchman. Somebody who is taking care to be aware of what's going on in that which he oversees. And then that rude word rule, 
Hyomenon, translated rule or lead, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, uh, verse 17, and verse 24. So we put all of these things together, all that we've read in those passages thus far, and it seems to me <clears throat> that the idea that the elder, also known as a bishop, also known as a shepherd, also known as a pastor, has the obligation of doing what an elder should do, and we didn't mention this earlier, but the idea of elder carries with it an older man. But it's the overseer. It's the watcher. And in the sense of what we read in Hebrews, it's the ruler. They are the ones in authority within the church. Again, within the authority given them by the pages of the New Testament. Elders just can't make up rules. They can't just change the doctrine of the cross uh, on their whim. It has to be in keeping with the New Testament which is why some of those qualifications that we read about were so stringent in making sure that they were followers and faithful of that word because that was going to be how they decided what must be done in the church was based on that word and on that scripture. And so we have elders or bishops or shepherds or pastors. And you notice, not say too much about this, but that word pastor, that's used quite often in our modern religious world. And again, we talk about this idea of the elders and bishops and their qualifications. Uh, that term pastor is used in so many ways that have nothing to do with the qualifications mentioned in the book of 1 Timothy and in the book of Titus. Pastor refers to an elder. He's not just a preacher of a local congregation as it's used in so many of, of our denominational friends' church. It's a position within the church, a very special position, that requires a very special person to fill in order to do that, again, as the New Testament has said, it should be done. And so the elders became the authority in the church. Whether they were the elders at Ephesus, whether they were the elders in Jerusalem, we know that they existed in the first century, or whether they're the elders here in Colorado Springs that oversee the congregation at 14th and Pikes Peak, or, or some of our sister congregations, they're the ones who hold that position of authority under Christ in the New Testament church in our modern era. And then continuing on with the structure and authority in the church, we come across a group of individuals called deacons. And deacons are an interesting place, if you will, within the New Testament. When we think about deacons, we read in Philippians 1 and verse 1, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. And again, we go back to the bishops, the elders, and the deacons. And so it, it seems to set apart this group as a, as a special group within the page of the church. Well, what is a deacon? Well, the word deacon comes from the Greek word diakonos. And that's one of those, we've mentioned it in previous lessons, but we might revisit this idea. There are some Greek words that our translators had trouble with that they couldn't find an exact word within the English language that would express what that Greek word meant. And so many times what they would do was simply substitute English letters for the Greek word, and you can hear that diakonos, deacon, and it's called a transliteration. It is actually making a new word that takes on a certain meaning uh, based on the context of that scripture. And that's all right. Uh, sometimes it would have been better, in my opinion, that they would have translated it differently. The word baptismo, which we get the word baptism from, the translator way of the word baptism, meant immersion. I think it would have been much less confusing for translators to have said immersion when they translated the Bible. But that's just Kevin's personal opinion for what that's worth. But diakonos is merely a servant. And that term can mean a servant in any form, any shape, any capaci capacity that it happens to be in. But in the church there, the bishops and deacons, and so we automatically have to assume that service has something to do with that term. Uh, W.E. Vine in his uh, works on biblical words says it denotes a servant, whether it's doing servile work or as an attendant re rendering free service without particular reference to its character. And so it's the idea of a servant, simply a servant there. Thayer says one who execute the commands of another, a servant, an attendant, a minister. And so as we think about this role of the deacon within the church, uh, we think about 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 through 13. And again, the bishop had qualifications. The elder had qualification. Likewise, deacons, verse 8, must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. 
But let there also be first be tested, and let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanders, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and a great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. And so obviously the role of a deacon, as they're described here in, in 1 Timothy, is a special place within the church. Some would call it an office, and I suppose that's okay. Some would call it a position. Whatever word you want to use with that. It's the idea of somebody who serves within the church, perhaps with a special mission, a special role within that. Some would go back to Acts chapter 6, when the, the Hellenist widows were being neglected. They brought that to the apostles, and the apostles said, We don't have time to leave the preaching of the gospel to wait tables. And so he asked the church, you appoint seven men, and he gave them certain qualifications about what kind of men you should choose, and they shall see to these things while we continue in the preaching of the gospel. The word deacon isn't used there, but it kind of gives us the idea of perhaps a, a foreshadowing of what was to come within the church. The deacons were special servants who did special things. We don't see anything in Scripture that gives us the idea that deacons had any more authority or as much authority as the elders. In fact, their authority, again, going back to Acts 6, if we want to use that, was in a specific mission. The elders asked them to do this. The congregation asked them to do this, and their authority extended into seeing that that got done, again, all under the oversight of the elders who ruled over that congregation. And so we have the elders in the church. We have deacons in the church. And then there's another group of people that are mentioned in the church, and those are the evangelists. And I think we understand basically what that means. These are the preachers. These are the ones who are uh, presenting God's word on a regular basis on Sunday morning. Ephesians 4 and verse 11. He gave some to be apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers. Ephesians 4 and verse 11. We read in Acts chapter 21 and verse 8. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Acts 21 and verse 8. Again, remember, Philip was the one mentioned in Acts chapter 6, who was one of the seven that was chosen to be perhaps there a deacon, a servant in that position. Now we find him serving in this capacity as an evangelist, a preacher of the word of God. But you be watchful in all things, Paul said to Timothy. Endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. And so again, we have elders. And notice only the elders, it is said of them that they rule. That they watch for your souls. That they have a, an inherent authority in the role in which they work. Deacons don't have a shall we say, a ruling role in the church. They are not junior elders, if you will, and evangelists fall into that same category. Yes, they preach the word, but what they preach is the word. It's not their own authority. It's the authority of Scripture that they preach. And so we have to understand that because it might be very easy for those of us who serve as ministers to think that we have some kind of authority. Well, we do. That authority is preaching the word of God and preaching only that word, not adding to it, not taking away from it, but preaching what it is that the New Testament says. But the elders are the one who have that ultimate authority, and that authority falls under the authority of Jesus as the head of the church. And so we've got several words that are translated uh, in this idea, this evangelist. Euangelistes is one of the words that's translated uh, evangelist there, and it's the idea of the proclaimer of good news, the, the idea of sharing the things of the faith. Uh, some words translated preach or proclaim, keruso, is the word that's there in the Greek. The word preach, also translated from the word, the Greek word laleo. Preach is also translated from the word kataangelo. And that's interesting in that the word, if you notice that last part of the Greek word, that in the English I've spelled out there, a-n-g-e-l-l-o, angelo, that's the word by itself from which we get our transliterated word angel and angels were messengers of God and so in that sense the preacher is the messenger of God not an angel obviously not in any spiritual significant sense like that but it's the same word that's used in that in that section 
And we look at some scriptures, Acts chapter 5 and verse 42. And daily in the temple and in every house they did not cease preaching, teaching and preaching, that's the word, euangelistes, Jesus as the Christ. And he commanded us to preach, caruso, to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be the judge of the living and the dead, Acts chapter 10 and verse 42. Acts 14 and verse 15. Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men with the same nature as you of you as you and preach you on the listes to you that you should turn from these useful things to the live, useless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all things that are in them. Acts 15 and verse 21. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach Caruso him in every city being read in the synagogues every sabbath and so again we see these people who are preaching and teaching the gospel and it's translated using euangelistes caruso in those cases here's another one in Acts 16 and verse 6 now when they had gone through phrygia in the region of galatia they were forbidden by the holy spirit to preach laleo the word in asia and so there's another one of those greek words that's used in that context Acts 16 and verse 10 now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach, you Evangelistes, the gospel to them, Acts chapter 16 and verse 10. And so this idea of those who went about preaching the word. You notice with the evangelists, there isn't that specific stringent list of qualifications that go along with that, indicating that it's a special office within the church, if you will. Yes, those who preached the word fulfilled that role that God had assigned them, that God had given them, that they had chosen to follow. But they have no authority other than what they preach. Again, the elders are the only ones within the church that seem to have any type of authority to make decisions within the church. And again, all of that falls under the umbrella of Jesus as the head of the church and the scriptures that were given to us to follow. And so as we think about this word evangelist, again, Romans 10 and verse 15, and how shall they preach, Caruso, unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings to good things. Preaching is a wonderful area of service. I'm glad I get to do that for a living. But it's something everybody can do and that anybody can do, and that is sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, preaching that gospel, using the word to convince others of their sin and see their need for Jesus Christ. So what do evangelists do? Well, again, some indeed preach Caruso, Christ, from even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. And so again, that word Caruso can mean preaching of any kind. He's talking about here good preaching and bad preaching. The former preach, and there's a different word that's used here, kata angelo, and again there's that, that idea of the angel word there. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains. And so anybody can preach, but what they preach is of paramount importance. It's got to be preaching Christ from the right reason, from the right, right motivation. Again, a few more verses. When they had gone through Phrygia in the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach, again, Leo in the word Asia. Now, after he had seen a vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had caused us to preach, you on Galistes, the gospel to them, Acts 16 and verse 10. And so, and again, how shall they preach Caruso unless they are sent? And so as we think about this idea of evangelists and what they do, uh, they preach the word, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2. Ephesians 4 verses 11 through 16, they equip and they edify. In 1 Timothy 1 and verse 3 and Titus 1 verses 10 through 13, they defend the faith. And they train others to teach as well, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. And so this structure and authority within the church, again, all falls under the heading of Jesus as the head of the church. And that through his inspired scriptures, he left instructions for how his church to operate. And the elders are the watchmen and the guardians of that scripture to see that that is what happens within the church. Deacons are special servants. But we can all be servants. And evangelists preach the word. And we don't all have to be paid evangelists like I am or like Grady is. We can all be evangelists in that sense. 
But that's the structure and authority of the church as we read about it in the New Testament. And it seemed to work quite well. And the only way that it didn't work is when people left the Word. They left Scripture. Paul complained to the Galatian church, I am amazed, that's my own wording, I'm amazed that you've gone after another gospel, which isn't a gospel, and you've left the gospel behind. And he makes this point. If we, or even if an angel from heaven preaches you, to you a gospel other than what we've preached, let that person be accursed. That's why we have elders to watch out for our soul. And we have deacons who serve. And we have evangelists who preach the word. But may we all strive to be servants. May we all strive to be preachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the Great Commission, go and teach all nations, was meant for everybody. Not just those specific roles within the church. And so as we said, this is an idea of what the structure in the church was all about. And we hope and pray that this has been encouraging to you, has been uplifting to you, has been beneficial to you this morning. And let's close our time with a prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. Thank you for this time we've spent together and looking at some of the things from your word. Help us to appreciate our elders and the important role that they take on in watching for our souls. Help us to be helpful to them and encouraging to them so their job is a joy and not a burden. We thank you for our deacons who serve so well and for everybody who takes a role in the church, whether they serve in an official capacity or not. And for all who preach the word, may that preaching be done with love, with encouragement, with edification that many souls may be saved. Thank you for our time together this morning, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Is it all set, Grady? All right. I got the thumbs up. I heard it get suddenly quiet, so I guess I better come up and start talking or something because that's me. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you here. And those of you who are watching on TV, it's good to, good to see you. I uh, can't really say that. <laughs> it's good that we're here. Uh, welcome to the Pikes Peak Congregation of Church Christ. Uh, if you are visiting, we're glad you're here. Stop and uh, say hello at some point to one of us or more so that we can shake your hand or bump your elbow or welcome you well. Um, if you haven't gotten your communion supplies yet, now would be a great time to jump up and go get them. We got them in the uh, baskets, I think you all are aware. And uh, we'll have some announcements and whatnot at the end of the service let you know everything that's going on and at this point we'll have a prayer and get into it let's pray our god in heaven thank you so much for loving us thank you for bringing us here together in whatever capacity it is that we're here together thank you for making a family of us and helping us to help each other God, please be on our hearts and our minds. Help us to do the things that we've learned from you to treat each other well, to bring each other closer to you, to ask for help when we need it and to give help when we can give it. I pray, God, you be on our hearts and our minds as we go through this hour and uh, worship you, learn from your words, sing together praises to you. I pray that you be with Grady and as he delivers the message to us that He'll remember the things that he studied from your word and that we'll be ready to accept it and make it part of our lives. Thank you so much for your love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Our first song will be A Wonderful Savior. We sing the first, second, and third, or fourth verse. So three verses. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He lighted my soul in the cleft of the road, where rivers of pleasure I see. He lighted my soul in the cleft of the rock, that shadows a dry, dusty land. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
song before our lesson will be A Mighty Fortress. I know Grady mentioned this a couple weeks ago as a song that doesn't get sung often here, but it's a song I like and hopefully you do all right. We sing in all three verses. <clears throat> Almighty fortress is our God. for our second prayer this morning. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again that we are able to be well enough to come here and worship with you, and we pray for those people who are not here that they may have whatever is limiting them helped. We know that this is the time when we often ask for special prayers for people in our group and people that we're aware of that, that need some type of help. We know that your plan is your plan, and we're a part of it, but we are human, and we ask for special dispensations on people when we see that they need them. We know that Jerry Nelson has been through surgery and is recovering from a difficult surgery. We know Be Betty Birch's daughter, Lori Palmer, is in the hospital with chronic bronchitis. We know Kevin is to have surgery this week. We pray that he will be 
return to us quickly from that. We know we have several people recovering from COVID. We know that we have lots of people in our congregation for various reasons that need your help and need our prayers. And we hope that as we go throughout our lives, we will see the need for these people and we will personally react to it and try to help them as best we can. We hope you'll be with us throughout the rest of the service. Thank you for bringing us here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This will be our song before the scripture reading and the lesson. If you're able, I'll ask that you stand for this song and then remain standing for the scripture reading. Scripture this morning is from Matthew chapter 12, 22 to 24. It will be coming from the English Standard Version. And it says, But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, unto innumerable angels in festival gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word, and the blood of Abel. You may be seated. Good morning. It's so good to see all of you here. I think we have even more in the auditorium this morning. As you know, three Sundays from today, Lord willing, we're going to go back to a full Sunday morning service classes for all ages. I think an attended nursery, uh, worship here in the auditorium, and follow the schedule that we did a year ago when the world shut down with the COVID virus. And in anticipation of that, some of you, you've had your first shot, your second shot, you're venturing out more and more. The balls are here for the first time in about a year, and Others are making their way back, and that's good news indeed. And this morning, we're starting a short series of lessons. And it's not because we have forgotten how to worship, how to assemble, how to come together, what we do and why we do it. 
Why, that's just part of our DNA. We don't need a lesson or a lecture telling us how vital this is to our walk with the Lord. But this Sunday morning, and maybe for the next couple or so, we'll just see how it lays out. I thought it would be good that we remind ourselves of some basic pillar truths. And one of them has to do with what we're doing and what we are this morning, and that's an assembly of God's family. Hope this morning that you've got your Bibles. And you might be looking over there in the book of Hebrews chapter 12. And Flo read these verses, verses 22 and 24. But what we're going to do is back up and get just a little bit of a running start. Hebrews chapter 12. Well, you look quickly and Hebrews has 13 chapters. And so just at a glance, we're coming down to the end of this letter. And the letter to the Hebrews, it's an apology, a defense. And it's a polemic. It's an argument. And the emphasis is that Jesus is better. No matter how you look at it. No matter how you look at him. Oh, God spoke different times, different ways to different people. But in these last days, he's spoken to us through his son, Jesus, and written primarily to the Hebrew people, to the Jews, those who had embraced the new covenant, but were wondering if they had made the right choice, the right decision, the right commitment, and they seem to be wavering and filled with doubts. The writer to the letter of Hebrews says, we can be confident in the captain of our salvation, Jesus. And you want to talk about angels? Okay. You want to talk about Moses? All right. The patriarchs and the prophets. But Jesus towers above them all, head and shoulders. And when we look at Hebrews chapter 12, it may be just a little reading between the lines. And your take may be a little different from mine, and that's just all right. But there seems to be this backdrop that the Jewish converts, now Christians, they were being told by their family and friends and their neighbors. I don't know why you've gone over to that new religion. Think what you've left behind. And when you think about Judaism in the first century, it had all the trappings of a major world religion. It had a magnificent temple. It had a priesthood with their distinctive robes. It had ceremony and ritual. It had a calendar. And the whole Jewish life was tied into holy days and festivals and fastings. And it was indeed an every day of the week kind of life. And Christianity had none of that. And so just looking at the two in comparison, the Jew could boast, and perhaps he did boast. We've just got it all over your new wrinkle of a religion. We're recognized by the Roman government and allowed to practice our faith. You're not. We have a magnificent temple and priesthood. We have a law. We have holy and sacred books. We have everything that makes a great faith. You have none of that. And it seems here in Hebrews 12, the writer is seizing all that. And this is one of his last great exhortations. And he says, yes, remember Exodus chapter 19. Israel came out of Egyptian bondage. 
And they made their way through the desert to Mount Sinai. And when they arrived, you remember the description of that mountain? Why it shook and trembled as the presence of the Lord was there. And there was thunder and lightning and clouds descending. And it was indeed an awesome and terrifying spectacle. And look what the Hebrew writer says about it. At the sound of the trumpet and the voice of the Lord, the hearers, Israel, standing on the plain, looking up and listening to that, begged for it to stop. It was just too much. It was overwhelming. And even Moses said, I tremble with fear. Now then, you want to talk about the old covenant? God's Ten Commandment law that he gave on Mount Sinai? And how Israel approached God in that venue at that place? All right. Yes, it was impressive. That's one word to describe it. But it was terrifying. And our people were filled with dread at the prospect of meeting God. And they begged Moses, you go on and you just tell us what you saw. You just tell us what he said. And Israel cowered in their tents. But now then notice the verses that we have before us this morning again. You have come not to that old mountain, but you've come to a new mountain and something infinitely better. And that verb, you have come, that's the word that we get proselyte from. And good Bible students that you are, you'll remember that a proselyte that was a convert, either a Gentile to the Jewish way of faith or a Jew to the Christian faith. And so he's talking about you've embraced something different and you're wondering, is it as good? Let me tell you that it's much better. And here the Hebrew writer rattles off eight things. I usually preach and teach from the New King James. You know that. This morning I asked Flo to read from the English Standard and he obliged me. And one reason why I did that is because if you're looking at this in the original, there's that conjunction, and, kind, and it's used eight times. We make a list, don't we? I've got a honeydew list somewhere. <laughs> Not just sure where it is. I make grocery store lists when Darlene calls me and tells me to stop on the way home. We all make to-do lists. And sometimes we make a bullet point. Sometimes we make it one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, the Greek language didn't allow for that. But they would number their list by the use of this joining conjunction. And the English Standard Version recognizes that and brings it over into our English language. You have come to Mount Zion. Not the physical, but the spiritual. And the more important, you have come to the city of the living God. The heavenly Jerusalem, that old Jerusalem, would be destroyed not long after the Hebrew writer wrote these words, we think. But the new Jerusalem that embraces all people, not just Hebrews, that will go on and on and on. You have come to untold, uncountable number of angels those ministering spirits. And if you remember the Old Testament stories of angels appearing and furthering along God's will, the Hebrew writer says they're still working today. They're still active today. 
And when we think about our revelation and our blessings, why, it was an angel that appeared to Mary and Joseph and declared the coming of Jesus into the world. It was angels that sang in His birth. And there were angels that ministered to Jesus during the time of His temptation. And the angels are a part of this no less than they were under the Old Covenant. And then an expression we'll think more about in just a minute. You've come to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. You've come to God, the judge of us all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. All those from the time of creation until now are made one by the blood of Jesus. That wasn't true of that old Jewish covenant. It was narrow. It was restricted. It was exclusive. Jesus welcomes us all now. You have come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and you've come to a blood that is better than Abel's that was shed upon the ground. Abel's blood cried out for justice. Jesus' blood, Jesus' blood cries out forgiveness and salvation. But the one expression in this that we're really singling out, you have come to, and depending on your favorite English Bible, you've come to the general assembly, you've come to the festive assembly, and to the church of the firstborn. And the firstborn there is plural. If it was the church of the firstborn singular, we might would think, well, that's Jesus, of course. But the firstborn, plural, that's all of us that are washed in the blood of the Jesus. And he talks about our grand assembly. You know, there's a couple of three words in the New Testament that are translated assembly. One of them, ecclesia. It's in this text. And another one is the word that has pan as a prefix means all and agora or agora, marketplace, pan. Some of you may remember pan American Airlines flew all through the Americas. I know you've heard of a pandemic, haven't you? Pan, all. Demos, people. A pandemic is a plague that affects all people everywhere. Well, here's the word for all the marketplace. Now then today, we've got malls, we've got strip malls, we've got mom and pop stores, and we've got flea markets, and we've got outlets, and we've got any number of places where you can do your shopping in this new world with the COVID. There's some healthy speculation that that old model is going to go by the wayside. And a lot of us, we buy more online now than we ever did. But in the ancient world, the marketplace, that was where everybody got. That was where you went if you had something to say. That was where you would go if you were running for office and wanted to make a speech. That's where you would go if you were courting and looking for a suitable young man or a young woman. That's where you would go to idle away the time. That's where you would go if you needed to buy something. And it was the nerve center of any community. And here the apostle or the writer is saying, here we are, and it's the assembly of all people, and that's the way that he describes the people of God. If someone asks, what is a Christian? What do they do? What do they believe? What do they think? How can you tell a Christian? Well, we would begin to answer that and 
The way that we would go about that maybe would differ from among us, but we wouldn't go into that discussion very long before we would also include this one defining characteristic of us. We come together. We join together. Here's the word that can be translated congregation, church, community, gathering, assembly. And that's part of our DNA and it comes from the Lord Jesus himself. Too many verses to count. Too many to begin to put on the monitor. But just think about Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And when he began his ministry and service to humanity, what did he do first? Maybe in just a few more weeks, if you're walking downstairs where the classes for the little fellows are being held, maybe we'll hear them sing. Jesus called them one by one. Peter and James and John. Jesus began to call disciples. And he would be the master. He would be the teacher. He would be the rabbi. And they would all be the learners but together, we see this group going throughout the Galilee and across the Jordan and down into Judea and all through the land that we call today the land of Israel. And here was this community of believers united through Jesus. And that's the way it was from Day one. And that's one of the most distinctive things about the disciples and the group that followed Jesus. On occasion, Jesus' critics would come and say, why does your master do this? Why does your master do that? And they came to the group so they could follow that question to Jesus. It was recognized and understood. They were the people of Jesus. And this was their group for collective identity. In one of the passages that we associate with Jesus most, John 17, just before his betrayal, just before his death on the cross, Jesus prayed for his disciples, and he says, not just for those who are with me here and now, but for all those who will believe in me. And Jesus said, I pray that they will be one. Some of the Bibles translated into languages other than English. Some of those, the guide for translating God's word into all the different languages suggests that another meaning to this, they were all together. And the idea is that they were blended into one. And my goodness, just let your eyes skim down through the words on the monitor there and just pick out the ones. I put them in small caps, underline them so they stand out a little bit. And Jesus says this once, twice, three times, four times. And these are only a handful of sentences. And this is Jesus' prayer over and over and over. I want my people to be together. I want my people to be one. And sure enough, when we turn over to the book of Acts, what do we see from the get-go? Jesus died and left them, but when he was raised back up, and when he assembled with them, he told them, I don't want you to leave and go back. You were fishermen. I've made you fishers of men now. 
You were tax collectors. You were whatever your former life and occupation was. Don't go back and pick up your old way of life. I've called you to a new call, a new way of life. And you stay there in Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. I've told you about it before. It's coming. And then your work will begin in earnest. And so we read after how Jesus ascended into heaven. All those disciples, they returned from the Mount of Olives to somewhere in Jerusalem. There they gathered together in an upper room. And not only what we would soon know as the apostles, but other brethren and the women who were part of that family of Jesus. And their number was about 120, we read. And they were together. They'd been together when they followed Jesus. Now that he's gone back to heaven, they're still together. And Jesus says, that's part of the commission and the commandment that I give unto you. Hebrews chapter 2. The Hebrew writer says something remarkable about when God's people come together. He talks about the sanctifier. That's Jesus. And he talks about those who are sanctified or set apart. That would be us through what Jesus does. And he says that when we are this way and share this relationship, we are all one or of one. And then notice that he quotes from the Psalms and he quotes from Isaiah. And if you look up those passages in your reference Bible, you'll see that these are references to God's family, God's children. And it's in this context, Jesus says, in the midst of their assembly, I will call them brethren. Remember, Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name. You can finish that, can't you? Right here, in the midst of us. All the assembly can be looked at as ritual tradition. It can be looked at as spectacle. It can be looked at as an event. But what we really see in our coming together, we come together, and it's in this assembly that we meet our Jesus in a way that's not like any other way. Yes, there's our daily walk with the Lord. We'll not discount that for a moment. Anytime, anywhere, any place, any reason, we can call upon our Lord and He is indeed with us. But when we come together as His people and His family, here the Hebrew writer says that Jesus is calling us His brethren. And He uses that phrase in the ascent. The first century. At the close of the first century, we think that the Apostle John received a revelation while he was exiled on the island of Patmos. A few people date the last book of the Bible a few years before that. But by the time, say, the year 100 rolled around, we're moving past the age of the Apostles into the second century. And very early on in the second century, there were Christians in what we would call today Turkey, the province of Bithynia. And Bithynia had a new Roman governor by the name of Pliny. Pliny the Younger. Pliny the Elder. His uncle had raised him. Pliny the Elder died. In that Mount Vesuvius blast that destroyed Pompeii and Herculaneum, Pliny the Younger was a lawyer and a writer. 
And a Roman statesman, a magistrate, and he was governor of Bithynia. And when he arrived in that far off place, he found Christians. And from his letter to the emperor Trajan, he says, in fact, I'd heard of them before, I just hadn't been around any of these people. And because the Romans were cracking down on illicit religious and political gatherings, and the church no longer was under the wing of Judaism, seen that way by the outsiders, the Christians were being persecuted. And Pliny the Younger wrote a letter asking for gods. He says, you know, they're, they're harmless. They're not hurting anybody. They're not really a danger and a threat. But you know, I'm understanding imperial policy. It's against them. And so, here's what I've done. I've arrested a few. And I've tortured a few. To find out just what they were doing. That's so awful. And he writes back and he says about the sum of their era is this. That on a fixed day, we know that's the Lord's day, the first day of the week. Before dawn, they came together. And they sang responsibly a hymn to Christ as a God. And that means they sang back and forth teaching and admonishing one another in songs and hymns and spiritual songs. And they bound themselves by an oath not to do some crime, some wicked deed, but instead they bound themselves to refuse a trust when called upon to do so that would be contrary to that. And then after meeting together in that assembly, they would dismiss and they would come back together for a potluck. What a great idea. And that's who these Christians are. Trajan, the emperor. Let me tell you everything I found out about. It. And among the things that he singles out and highlights, they come together. One day of the week. And they worship. And they sing. And they love one another. And they eat together. And that's about the whole ball of wax right there. And so, Pliny said, I'm kind of giving them a little bit of a liberal hand. Oh, they're illegal, but I'm not cracking down on them. Arrest one every now and then. Kill one every now and then if I have to. And Trajan answered back, and this correspondence still is available. Any good library online if you need to. Trajan says that sounds like a good policy to follow. Within a few more years, Rome would change that lenient handling. And we'll read about the Christians being burned at the stake, thrown to the lions in the arena, and all the other awful things. But who are they? And what do they do? Well, here's the busy governor of Bithynia, and he's not sending an encyclopedia article. This is everything I found out about these people, but isn't it noteworthy? Isn't it significant? That of all the things he could say about God's people, here's one that leads the list. Every first day of the week, that fixed day, they come together. They assemble. Well, that's us. I'm not going to stand up here and argue, and I suppose you wouldn't argue either, that... Pick the three most, the ten most, the fifty most important ways to describe what it means to walk pleasing to the Lord that we would put church attendance at the very top of the list. But now then when we begin to look at the language of the New Testament and what it says about the assembling of ourselves together, 
And here when we read what an outsider observed, he investigated, and what he concluded is one of the most distinctive features about these people. It's our coming together as one family. It's a precious time. It's an important time. And it's a time that we give a priority to. Sickness gets in the wood. Some things come along that are beyond our ability to control. And we trust that the good Lord knows what that is, when that is, and how we deal with it. But week in and week out, year in and year out, part of our walk with the Lord is our coming together. And that's so important to us. This morning as we close with this invitation, it simply might be, and if you're not a part of that assembly, that gathering, that community, that family, that church, that's the way of life that you need to investigate. That's the walk that you need to follow. And we stand open and ready and eager at any time to sit down and discuss these matters with you in hopes that maybe you too would put on Jesus and be our brother, be our sister, and be one with us in the family of God. This morning, if that appeals to you, at this time and place, and you would just let us know, why not now, while we stand, and as we sing this song together. Just as I am Seated, please. Psalm before the Lord's Supper this morning will be Hallelujah, what a Savior. We'll sing all five verses. I'll ask that we sing the fourth verse softly, which will start with the phrase lifted up. So when you see that, we'll sing that one softly. And then the last one we'll sing loudly.
To help us prepare for the Lord's Supper, I want to read one passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, just verse 7. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. We normally read these passages prior to the offering because they give us a checklist of three characteristics we are to have if God is to accept our offering. What do they have to do with the communion, though? If they describe the characteristics that we need to simulate when we give, I think these passages also tell us something about the nature of our God as he gave his son on the cross of Calvary. So let's think about this passage in a little bit different light this morning. What does it tell us about God in saving us? One, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart. That's why we see in Genesis the statement, let us make man in our image. And we see in the writings of both Peter and Paul that at the same time God and his Son and the Holy Spirit decided to create man. They already had a plan in place. God had already predetermined that he would save us from our sins by giving his Son on the cross. Not grudgingly, or of necessity. When God created that plan to give his son on the cross, there was no one telling God, you have to do this. It was something that came from his heart because he wanted to to fellowship with something he had created that had the choice to love him back. He did it not out of compulsion. He didn't have to create us, and he didn't have to save us with his son. But he did that anyway. And third, for God loves a cheerful giver. We're reminded from the passages in Luke about the lost son, the lost sheep, and the lost coin. That when one who God has created, who has been lost, is found, there is great rejoicing in heaven. It cheers God's heart to have someone respond to his love, to love him back. 
That's what he did for us when he sent his son to die on the cross. Think about this as we partake of these next two emblems. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks that you loved us enough to send your son to die upon the cross, to allow his body to be hung upon that cross instead of our own. As we partake of this loaf, which represents that body, help us to understand the pain and agony that he went through to save us. Bless this loaf and bless those who partake of it. It's through his name we pray. Amen. If you would bow and pray with me once again. Father, we are eternally grateful for the great love, the great mercy that you have extended to us by allowing your son to shed his blood on that cruel cross. We ask that you would bless this cup which represents that blood, that you would bless those partaking of it. And again, we pray this through his precious name. Amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. Normally at this time we would pass the collection plate, but because of COVID we do not do that at this time. Many of you have already given online or through some other means. If you brought your contribution this morning, there are baskets at each entry and exit point. Make sure you drop that in the basket, and if the men who count have already collected those, get those to one of the men in the congregation and they can get them to the counters. We're not going to reread that passage that we normally use prior to giving, but I want to read the passage before that and the passage after that and make a couple of comments. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. We have some friends and neighbors that I think misinterpret and misapply this passage. They teach that we should be generous in our giving so that God can in turn give us even more. I don't think that's the intent of Paul's writing here. If you skip down to verse 8, I think he gives us the intent. Verse 8 says this, And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Our giving should not be so that God can give us even more in return. After all, we're told by Luke in chapter 6, verse 35, that we're to lend to our enemies expecting nothing in return. Then why do we give? It's an exercise to build our faith. We predetermine, we plan ahead as to what we're going to give. At the first of the month or whenever we get that paycheck. And even if something unforeseen comes up, an emergency repair, an emergency surgery, medical issues, we give as we had predetermined we were going to give we see that God somehow provides what we need even through those emergencies of life. So it builds our faith, our trust in Him. Let's pray. Father, we recognize that You have been so generous to us in the things You have given. You have breathed the breath of life into us You supply those physical needs that we have to have in order to survive in this world. 
Through Christ, you have given us every spiritual blessing to live in your kingdom here on earth. And we know that he has gone to heaven and that he is busy preparing a place for us to live eternally with you. What more could we ask for? Help us, Father, to show our appreciation for your generosity by the way we give, trusting that you will provide those things that are needed in life. Again, we thank you for giving your Son on the cross. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So song before our closing prayer and our announcements will be God be with thee till we meet again. We'll sing the first and the last verse of this song. God be with you till we meet again. By his counsels, God uphold you. With his shoes of joy, he fold you. God be with you till we meet again. Till we meet again. There'll be some announcements following the closing prayer. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are so blessed to be part of your family, so blessed to be called and numbered among your children. Father, you have provided everything that we need every day. You sustain us, give us life, provide us a way to, to, to be in that family of yours through the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for all these things. Father, we ask that as we go through this week that you would be with us, help us to make every decision, every action, uh, every thought uh, more in line with, with, our, with our Lord, our example. Father, we pray that, uh, that you would give us the strength and comfort and the, and the courage to do these things. Father, we pray that you would watch after us as we, as we leave this place and bring us back. And it's in our Lord Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Springtime in the Rockies. We hope, although none of us will be surprised if winter doesn't throw us another blast or two on the way out, and it's in March and April that we hope for something wet to fall. We put in our order for rain, but if it comes with snow, that's just the way it is. We have any number that we are lifting up in our prayers, and all of these names are in our church bulletin. Carissa 
emails that out from the church office every Thursday afternoon, and we hope that you're adding these names to your own prayer list. Audrey Cronquist is continuing to undergo tests, and the doctors are determining just what they might do to help her with her seizures and raise her blood count. Sister Yvonne Williams will be having tests on her heart, and our prayer that that might not uncover anything so terribly, terribly serious, but Yvonne can soon be feeling well and proceed with the good plans, the big plans that she has, we know, later on this spring and summer. We're also remembering Jerry Nelson as she recovers from neck surgery, and Larry Grizzell, knee replacement surgery, and Kevin Ballard as he's on the mend from his recent gallbladder surgery. Lori Palmer is now home, and she's recovering from a case of severe bronchitis. Our brother Jim Hammond, Judy, and the family, and the Meachams, and so many, many more. And these are not just ticking off names on a list. All of these are precious to us, and these and others beside. We lift up to our Father in prayer. Two Sundays from right now, Lord willing, March the 21st, Bible classes for all ages and worship at our church building starting at 9 o'clock and then 10 o'clock, attended nursery. And if you're able to help out with that good work, please let Dana Church know. And then on Sunday afternoon, starting March 21st, we will have our worship stream right here on our YouTube channel at 1 o'clock. 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Kevin's Bible class will stream at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. So two weeks from right now, we'll not be having our morning streams on our Pikes Peak YouTube channel. But that will move to 1 o'clock in the afternoon and 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And all the plans that we have and the hard work that we're doing to get back together, we ask the Lord's blessings upon that and upon us all until we meet again.